In my early 2000s, we used to talk about the brain index, how the, how the construction work is going. And China has further progress. And now I think the time may come, we will count by the kilometers of the rail, especially the faster rail systems. But of course, there are problems. India is trying to get. But what we got from Japan is much more, much more costlier and speed wise. So, but all for the all, for all these details, we have a, somebody specializing in the China's bullet trains and the infrastructure in general. He is doing his PhD in Princeton University. I don't call it Kyle Chan, not a doctor, but Kyle Chan is soon. I think next time we will meet him as Dr. Kyle Chan. So, it's okay. 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 Yeah, okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, Rapoji, for introducing me. Um, is it okay if I sit? Or do you guys introduce him? Okay. Um, so, hi, everyone. Namaskar. Raja Hong. Um, so, um, it's very exciting for me to come uh, speak with you guys. Um, I'm very excited to present some of my uh, research uh, and also to kind of learn more about your, your work and I think there's a lot of overlap. So, it'd be, it'd be fun to uh, chat. Uh, and maybe, I don't know what your format usually is, but maybe it would be helpful if you could um, even ask questions during the presentation. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay, but normally we go for ah, okay. 20 or 30 minutes. That's fine. Then, oh, okay, great, great. Yeah, because I'm not sure which aspects you're curious about. Maybe nobody here cares about trains, which is fine. <laughs> but maybe you do care about uh, some of the geopolitics or Bell and Road or something like that. So I'm happy to talk about any of these things. So maybe you can just kind of let me know there's some parts that are really boring, and let me know there's some parts that are very interesting, and I'll talk more about those. Um, so I'll give you a little bit more background about myself. Um, you're probably wondering, who is this guy? Where is he actually from? Um, so, I'm, uh, I was born in the U.S. and I grew up in the U.S., but um, my family comes from Hong Kong, and um, I did not grow up in China at all, but, you know, I go back now for research, and, um, and I also uh, do research on, uh, on India as well. So, my dissertation, which I'm working on, um, uh, in the Department of Sociology at Princeton, is looking at infrastructure development in China and India, um, and the role of state capacity and my, my main lens is through the railways, which I think are extremely important here and in China. Um, and I think also a very interesting test of how uh, a state can, can deliver on public goods um, and implement very complex projects effectively. So this is why I chose to study uh, trains. I actually don't really care about trains per se, but I'm interested in them as a way to understand how governments operate and how the state operates. So, uh, and I also don't, don't know that much about the technical aspects. So if you ask me questions, I've given um, uh, sort of similar talks or had similar discussions with um, you know real railway engineers, and their questions often get very into the weeds on the technical details. So I don't actually know that much, and in some ways I don't want to know that much because I already have enough to do. <laughs> but um, but uh, my focus is more on the organizational issues that are involved, institutions and things like that. So um, okay, so I'll just dive into it. Um, oh, actually, first of all, I'm kind of curious. Um, how many of you guys have um, been to China and taken the high-speed trains there? Mm -hmm. Okay, actually, a fair number of people. Okay, I don't need to ask if anyone's taken any of your because I feel like that's a that's a good one. Um, okay, that's very interesting. Um, so um, maybe I'll start. Uh, so kind of the outline of my talk. Um, I'll try to keep it. Uh, yeah, I'll try to spend your time. Um, I'll just kind of introduce uh, the bullet trains. Um, give a little bit of the historical background, um, and then touch on certain aspects that I think are important to um, how China built its bullet train system. So organizational structure, technology, um, some of the land issues, which are very big here, and uh, China dealt with it differently in certain ways. Um, and then financing, and then I'll just kind of talk about some implications, and then open up for discussion. So uh, first I'll start with just some photos that I've taken myself. So for those who haven't been to China or haven't 
had the chance to check out the high-speed trains. Um, so on top of building these new bullet trains, there's a big building screen for all the new stations. So this is Suzhou, and a lot of now uh, major Chinese cities have even more than one bullet train station. And oftentimes these are stations that are dedicated for bullet trains only. So they're not freight, they're not normal passenger, they're really bullet train stations. Um, this is the old Beijing railway station. It got it got revamped, but um, I think this might be Suzhou as well. So uh, you can see kind of these electronic boards that tell you the time schedules. Um, yeah, they uh, heavily, you know, it's funny, right? This is always irony. In, in communist China, they heavily, heavily uh, monetize everything um, because it's important um, to, uh, to to get funding to, to uh, make these sorts of investments. Uh, so you can see here again, uh, maps and announcements, usually um, kind of a whole litany of warnings of what not to do. Um, here's uh, people waiting in line to buy tickets, right? Um, actually, most people don't really need to do this because most people just buy tickets online and then they can... Um, Still you have to do that again? Uh, if you're a foreigner, you do. Oh. Um, a lot of these people are here to change tickets or to buy tickets, maybe because they just did the last minute. But most people just buy it online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I still have to buy it. I still have to pick it up. And, and so this is very different than um, the Indian train system, for example. So uh, Indian railway stations, you can walk in. Um, but Chinese are very strict about who they let through security. So it's more like an airline system, right? So you need to scan um, your ticket into these gates in order to just enter the platform itself. You're not able to just... Uh, and, and of course, in order to enter the station, uh, to begin with, you need to go through security. So mm -hmm. here are people rushing to get on or off um, uh, one of the trains. You can see also uh, one of the older trains. So um, uh, the older train systems still do run, although they've been slowly phased out. So as you can see here, um, many of the stations get very, very crowded. So I think it's very interesting to me that you know, China and India, I think, in particular, share some of the share, share certain similar characteristics, including um, very high population densities, where mass transit seems to make sense economically, uh, perhaps more so than, than other countries. Um, you know, you can see here some of the, the they clean these trains so much because they get so dirty because they I don't know how many bus they go along the way. Um, this is Beijing to Harbin. Um, here's inside the trains themselves. So they're, they're, they're kind of designed almost like a, like an airline, right? So they're sealed, you can't open the windows, um, and, uh, you know, AC. Uh, this is, um, all those other pictures I were my own. So here's the first sort of state uh, photo I'll show you guys. I'll try to not show you so many state photos. I want to show you my own, my own personal photos, but um, this is sort of to show a control center for, for some of these trains. So, uh, as you guys might be familiar with, um, other countries also have bullet train systems. Japan's was the most famous uh, and the earliest. Um, but um, China, in the past decade or so, has um, built uh, a bullet train system that is, as every um, Chinese newspaper likes to say, um, larger than all the, all the other countries combined. Um, so, there's some interesting facts about the trains, the bullet trains. So, HSR high speed rail. Um, new uh, track completed each year averages about 2,700 kilometers, which is an astounding amount. Um, it is, I believe, greater than what Indian Railways lays down in the conventional um, track. Um, and this is on top of um, conventional track, which China is also expanding, as well as uh, freight. Um, roughly 4,000 trips a day, um, 4.6 4 million passengers per day. These numbers are actually already out of date, and this is a problem with these trains because um, use has been exploding on certain um, lines um, so that numbers get out of date within months. Um, a large percentage of passengers have now shifted over from conventional line to high-speed rail. Um, oh, by the way, also, if anyone wants a copy of this presentation, I'm more than happy to share it with you afterwards, but you can just ask me as well, um, in case you guys are trying to frantically take notes, or at least I like to do so. So, um, also, a lot of these, uh, the train system was designed really to connect major urban centers. So now, over 80% of Chinese cities larger than 2 million people are connected in this system. Uh, and now there's, originally there's the, the, the beginning was sort of along the coastal areas and in the more developed urban um, centers. Um, 
And now there's a shift to extend the system further out into the west, right, which is less developed, um, but uh, in an effort to try to deal with some regional inequalities in the country, which um, have grown over time. So, and then just to give you sort of comparison, um, a trip from Beijing to Shanghai, which is roughly the same distance from Delhi to Mumbai, um, takes the very fastest trains with the minimum number of stops, takes less than four and a half hours, which is pretty fast. Um, and uh, yeah, I try to compare it to, when I speak to an American audience, I try to compare it to Chicago to New York, which is something kind of similar. Um, so uh, yeah, it depends on how many stops, and also um, it is more expensive, right, than national trains. It is more expensive than trains here. So there's a trade-off, obviously. In fact, um, in the debate around high-speed rail in China, some people argue that it wasn't worth it to invest in an expensive system that a still developing country um, would, um, it, it would basically be biased in favor of the wealthy, the, the, the smaller wealthy minority, rather than um, something that could be used by um, the broader population. Other people argue that no, actually, um, even migrant workers in China use the um, high-speed trains often because it is still cheaper than flying and it doesn't take two or three days to travel back home. Um, two or three days of wages lost is pretty substantial. So um, there's, there's a big debate. Um, I'll just mention a few um, similarities with, with Indian railways, right? So there's central, central government control, one of the largest employers in the world. Um, very a politically powerful ministry. So the railway ministry here is very powerful, and the former railway railways ministry in China was also very powerful until it got broken apart. And I'll come back to this. Um, right. There are a number of debates about private entry, and they face competition from other modes of transport. Um, okay. Well, let's step back. So this is just going to be a preview. Um, so how did this all come about? And um, I would trace this back to. Um, some ideas that, of course, we all have to quote Deng Xiaoping and talk about how um, he had a vision for some kind of, a different kind of China than um, the Mao years. And um, this is him riding the Shinkansen um, during his um, famous trip to Japan. Um, and he, here he's saying, right? so it, it feels fast. So he was very diplomatic about it because he didn't want to say, oh, wow, this is incredible, we need to have one of these. Although I think, my, my assumption is that he, he kind of was thinking that. Um, but of course, this is Japan, right? And it's something maybe akin to India riding a Pakistani bullet train and, and saying the same thing. So there, there's some sort of geopolitical um, sensitivities here. But I think it's very interesting that um, this trip, I think, was very formative in shaping um, Dutch Shopping's thinking about how China should look going forward. And um, interestingly, fast forward to the present day, right? Now you have um, the current Chinese uh, leader um, taking, you know, Vladimir Putin in this case, and trying to show off how advanced um, China is. Right. So the the idea is the the China's position of the world in the, in the world has changed, and the roles have, have switched. At least that's the narrative, right? That is being presented. Um, so in terms of the development of the trade system, right, in the 90s uh, and late 80s, as the Chinese economy is really taking off, there were freight bottlenecks, um, which really threatened um, power supply across the country, especially in the south. So um, coal transport, which relies heavily on trains, was um, uh, was exceeding the uh, the freight capacity of the railway system. So there was an effort to try to develop um, bullet trains indigenously, um, and there were several rounds of sort of speeding up the average um, pace of trains. Um, this actually took a very different turn when the railway minister Liu Zhijun decided to pursue what was called the leapfrog strategy. Um, he also called it a great leap strategy. Um, kind of unfortunately, but he his vision was to actually um, um, bring in foreign technology, which I'll, I'll touch on as well in a little bit, um, rather than rely purely on indigenous development. Um, and his plan was to go from zero to 12,000 kilometers of high-speed uh, track by 2020. And this actually this target in, in typical trains fashion has been exceeded by um, maybe now double. Um, so the first sort of true um, passenger dedicated high speed rail line opened, um, of course, right before one of the most important events uh, in the 21st century of China, which is the Beijing Olympics, um, the Beijing Tianjin line. And, um, and of course, you have many high profile speakers, many high profile people who came, including this is um, House Speaker, US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, and the program got a further boost after the great, uh, great financial crisis, um, as China was trying to struggle with how to offset 
a client export demand. Um, so it pursued what is now a very classic Chinese sort of textbook strategy of using a, a massive fiscal stimulus um, to try to offset um, uh, issues in the, uh, in the broader economy. I think we see something very similar happening today with the trade war uh, with the US. So um, a lot of the stimulus, it turns out, was funneled into the railways because the railways are perfect for stimulus. Right? They take, they're very expensive, they take a lot of money, a lot of resources, steel output, um, energy output, all of this can be channeled towards a very, very large project, and also it employs a lot of people. So um, then in 2011, 2011 marked another turning point because there was um, a major uh, series of corruption investigations against the railway industry. The same Gokujun who was um, seen as largely responsible for spearheading this effort, he is now in jail for life. Uh, on corruption. So, um, and his legacy to this day is still very mixed. Um, also, later on, um, it's not clear exactly what are all the links um, in these events, but later on there was a major um, collision in Wenzhou that um, was widely covered. Um, and actually, there was a cover up in China, um, and then later on they had to uh, actually make it public. So, this further sort of eroded um, public confidence in. Um, in the railway system and in the government and being able to be truthful about some of these things. Uh, so uh, fortunately this was, this did spur a, uh, a lot of reform. The Ministry of Railways, which had existed for, um, since essentially the, the founding of, of the People's Republic, was broken up. Um, and in fact, to this day, um, any railways, uh, many people talk about breaking up the Ministry of Railways or any railways into something similar, into a regulator and an operator, right? Um, so, and um, the story's not over yet. In fact, uh, I was almost sort of excited to hear just from my own research state that um, there's actually even more plans to invest and expand in um, Chinese, China's high-speed rail network. So, um, and this includes, of course, um, the Belt and Road, which I'm sure you're all very tired of hearing about, but we can, we can discuss this as well. Um, it includes projects in other countries, although the record has uh, more recently been mixed because of some political backlash in a number of different countries. I can talk about that as well. Um, so what is the organizational structure of the Chinese railway industry? At one level, it looks kind of, um, it looks kind of like actually many railway industries, right? You have a Ministry of Finance, um, a major operator, a regulator, um, you know, uh, Fog Highway, which is the uh, planning commission essentially of China. Um, you have the manufacturers, right? these are all SOEs, these are all state-owned enterprises who produce the trains. And then you have the civil engineering country, uh, uh, companies that produce the, that lay the tracks and build the bridges and tunnels. Um, right. And so just to emphasize, this is all, um, these SOEs are under the control of SESAC, which uh, you guys may have heard of, which is a major, they sort of control, they're sort of a holding company for um, most of the central uh, government SOEs. Um, Although the China Railway is, is famously outside of that. It's, it's some people that I've spoken with say that it still acts a little bit like the Ministry of Railways to the same. So the process of reform is a long one, um, and it's still incomplete. Um, so I just want to point out uh, a couple uh, interesting features of the Chinese um, railway system uh, and its construction process, because that's what I focus on. So one is just that um, China relies heavily on SPVs, right, special purpose vehicles, um, which is very different, I think, than um, how most things work in India in terms of um, public sector projects. Um, this, there have been some efforts to build um, sort of PSUs, public sector undertakings that are specialized, um, but for the most part, it's, it's less done here. It's a very key component of the Chinese system, right? So you have a project company that, say, for example, builds, is responsible for building the, the high-speed rail line from Beijing to Shanghai, and then um, that is, it, it gets an equity stake from the um, China Railway Corporation and an equity stake from the local governments. Right? By local government, I mean the provincial governments. So they have this big negotiation, they decide the um, allocation of, of um, funding, and then uh, board seats are allocated and on the project company, and then the project company is the one that actually executes. Now, the project company itself doesn't actually build anything. They actually, their primary responsibility is to manage contracts and to manage the entire process. So they deal with the contractors that I mentioned earlier, those SOEs. Um, and the second kind of feature I just want to point out is that um, you have this interesting um, managed competition uh, setup in China. 
um, which is very, very common among SOEs. So rather than having these, so on, on the outside, it may look like there's just two giant companies in China, right? Um, these are both uh, infrastructure companies. And they build not just Chinese railways, but they also build um, highways, and um, they do real estate development. They do a whole, a whole bunch of things. They're kind of like a large material here. Um, but actually, in reality, they're composed of, they're comprised of many different subsidiaries, which are then, in turn, comprised of many subsidiaries, which all compete for contracts. So on the one hand, um, you have these parent companies that make sure that there's not too much competition, that uh, assets or sort of resources are sort of allocated in a way that um, uh, allows for enough competition. At the same time, you do have each of these individual units um, fighting um, for, for contracts. So that's sort of an interesting um, feature. Um, in terms of technology acquisition, this is uh, an area that I don't cover as specifically, but I did want to kind of cite some research that I've, I've read about this. Um, it's very interesting because the Ministry of Railways coordinates very heavily with um, other R&D institutions, the industry, um, universities. So um, the Chinese Academy of Railway Sciences is obviously a key part of this, but also um, there are several key um, Chinese universities that some of which actually belong to the railways originally, but were siphoned off, but now are the key sort of R&D hubs. And they team up with rolling stock manufacturers, for example, um, the actual bullet train makers themselves in China to um, do R&D. And I had a chance to visit um, a number of these universities. Um, and then another key component of the technology acquisition process is these JVs with foreign firms, right? So um, China does this classic strategy, um, which is now a very controversial, especially in the ongoing trade war between the US and China, where China exchange essentially exchanges market access for technology, right? So the, the deal was um, Siemens or Alstom, these sort of large global you know, European or Canadian um, train manufacturers had to team up with a Chinese partner in order to get access to the Chinese market. And the deal was you can get access now to the largest, what will be the largest uh, high-speed rail market in history. And in exchange, you need to be able to hand over some technology or train our staff or do something that invests in the long-term capabilities of the Chinese railway industry. Um, this is something that I urge uh, Indian railways folks to pursue, but I get some pushback in terms of what the organization capabilities of Indian railways are. But I think this is, in a way, a strategy that many developing countries should take, which is, especially the large ones, which is you should try to use your market access. So um, different Chinese companies would team up with different uh, foreign manufacturers and establish JVs. And actually, it's kind of funny. If you look at these trains, if any of you have been to Germany or Japan, um, these trains will look really familiar. And I've never been to China. You'll feel like you've, you've already taken the Chinese train because you have, right? So um, this is a essentially a Japanese train concept. Um, this train looks very much like the um, German ICE trains that are the German bullet trains. Um, so, anyways, now today, of course, um, China has what they tout to be um, their own indigenous Chinese um, bullet trains, um, which are called Fuxing Hong, which is uh, rejuvenation. Um, the old Chinese trains used to be called Kuxia Hop, which means uh, Harmony Express. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I think it also marks a shift in political tone. Um, right, so the idea now, though, is that China absorbed through this process of market access in exchange for technology, absorbed foreign technologies, sort of embarked on this process of re-innovation, as they call it, and created their own Chinese trains. Actually, the Chinese auto industry, the Chinese um, energy industry, many industries actually went through the same uh, process. And it's sort of funny, I don't know if you guys know um, the four great inventions, sit up on me, um, of ancient China, right? So the compass, paper, um, gunpowder, and uh, printing press. Um, What's so, the last one, sorry? Uh, printing. Not a not couple time, but, but printing. Um, and now, today, people are saying, if you can, if you can guess, um, I don't know, can you, can you guys guess what are the four uh, new great inventions? So they are uh, bike share, which I take all the time when I'm in China. It's fantastic. Um, online payments, uh, mobile payments, which also is extremely uh, fun and, and, and really great to use. So I never have to use cash in China at all. I literally just can walk outside with my, my phone and, and pay for everything. Um, online shopping and bullet trains. Ironically, of course, many people have pointed out none of these were actually invented in China, right? But they are the, they are the, what's that? What's the first one? 
the bike share. Bike share. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I'll just touch a little bit on the land process. Um, one of the ways that China got around um, land issues. Um, so here in India, right, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the difficulties in land acquisition and the various controversies and the delicate balance between social issues and sort of public infrastructure development um, that makes it very challenging to um, build large-scale infrastructure, whether it's railways or whether it's creating sort of new SEZs or something like that. Um, China followed actually a model that was pioneered um, by the Japanese. Um, and the Japanese Shinkansen's, when they were built, they really tried to minimize um, land use. And they tried to build mostly bridges and tunnels and viaducts. And so China tried to do the same thing. So um, land acquisition is still um, not easy in China. Everyone I talk to um, says it's the hardest part by far of the railway development process. <coughs> actually building the tracks, actually building the, the bridges and the tunnels, there are certain engineering challenges, but it, it hardly compares to the social challenges of trying to um, acquire land. Um, at the same time, of course, right, um, the Chinese system is a very different political system than the Indian one or the American one. Right here, you do have access to, and like in the U.S. and in Japan and in Europe, you do have access to external forms of recourse. Right, you have an independent judiciary. You do have uh, um, uh, media and opposition parties and NGOs who can um, sort of act as the voice of local residents, and that is obviously much much more limited. Or if if not existing uh, in the interest of China. Although, of course, there are protests um, and there is backlash in the against, um, against land acquisition, especially in urban areas in China, um, where real estate prices have skyrocketed and um, uh, there's still an issue about how much compensation should be. Okay. Oh, this was just kind of to show you some of the, uh, the blueprints for how they, how they plan. Um, right? So they simultaneously build bridges and tunnels at the same time. Uh, the red is uh, uh, is uh, bridges, and the, the purple uh, are tunnels. Anyways, the point the point here is just that a lot of it happens in parallel, which is a very key feature of the Chinese system. This is one of these sort of bridge bridge laying um, uh, pieces of equipment, and I just want to touch on financing a little bit, and I'll try to wrap up. So um, China does spend uh, a tremendous amount of uh, financial resources on the Chinese real estate, right? So this is in comparison to India, just to give you some kind of um, point of reference. Um, but essentially, annual spending, annual investment by China on its railways is at least five times, if not greater, um, India's annual spending. Um, and where does this money come from? Most of it is debt. So today, actually, this is a major issue. Um, and in fact, this is an issue across a lot of um, Chinese sectors, um, which is this explosive debt issue. So, um, and who holds this debt? Well, 95% of it is domestic, and a lot of it is held actually by um, state banks. That's right, so the four big state banks, as well as China Development Bank. Um, so, uh, railway bonds are actually mostly held by uh, Chinese banks. So, um, there are questions about financial sustainability, especially since most, for the most part, um, the high-speed rail lines in China are loss-making, except for a few very, very heavily trafficked ones, like Beijing China. Um, so there's a question about how long this can go. Um, there's also a question about how much the government should be subsidizing. Um, but maybe argue it's a public good, although some people argue it's a private good because you're just paying a uh, fare. Um, so uh, I just want to kind of wrap up and, and kind of broaden the scope a little bit and just mention that this uh, Chinese railway sort of um, the bullet train project, this rapid, um, you know, uh, uh, construction of the of the world's largest bullet train system, is in many ways not um, an exception to the Chinese experience, but representative of broad a broader sort of um, uh, um, enthusiasm for massive infrastructure building and sort of these superlatives of, you know, the um, greatest amount of wind wind power or the largest. Um, dam, or the largest, world's largest airport, the longest bridge, um, and it's sort of interesting to see um, how much this is part of. It seems like, at least right now, um, the the DNA of the Chinese state to keep emphasizing the the tallest, longest, the the biggest, and and I do think that there are some interesting um, historical uh, roots to this, especially given 
China's um, relationship with the Soviet Union, right, which it was trying to emulate and saw as a model, or ultimately trying to overtake the West. Um, so uh, just to kind of wrap up, you know, there's a lot of broader implications of this. Um, so there's implications for the Belt and Road, and um, we, can, we can talk about any of these topics or, or other ones. There's implications at Belt and Road in terms of whether China can still pull off the same sorts of um, feats in other countries in very different political environments. Um, there's implications for China's efforts now to build these sort of urban uh, mega clusters like um, Jinjinji, right, which is Beijing, Tianjin, and uh, uh, um, and um, the area around China, essentially. Right? There's implications for the relationship between the state and market in China, as well as um, Chinese economic reforms and technological development. Uh, and of course, there's always implications uh, for um, India-China relations and Chinese sort of um, relations in the broader South Asia, uh, South Asia uh, uh, context. So um, maybe with that, I'll stop and open up the floor for questions. Um, but thank you for all this talk. So thank you, friends. I think we had a really good overview of the Chinese oil chain system and how they were left. I think I will not get into much of the details, but I thought what he was, uh, Chan was describing, <coughs> two interesting things. What happened to the Chinese railway minister, who used to be always a powerful mm -hmm. where he's standing now, and you think that by oil trains is really diminished by the, or what happened to the railway uh, trade union system? Mm -hmm. That was a very interesting component of the all-China trade union. Mm -hmm. You can add those things you can take up later. Yeah, I think we'll open for the question. People are more interested to know the bullet thing. Okay. Uh, I have one of these small questions. Yeah. Uh, easy for him to, to introduce, please. Okay. Well, my name is Ravi Bhatia. I've never been to China. Once I did get an opportunity, but I did get the visa. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Uh, my question, there are two questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you know, you said that there's a, uh, there's a lot of debt incurred because of, you know, the building and construction of this, uh, the train and the, uh, the uh, acquiring land, etc. So, is that uh, percentage of, uh, uh, you know, debt decreasing over the time or is it uh, increasing or is it more or less remaining the same? And if so, uh, who's paying for this? The government or whatever? This is number one. The other question is, is uh, the, the entire railway system, I mean, uh, this bullet train, as well as uh, uh, as well as the tracks, etc., are they all indigenous built or uh, you are taking help? I mean, China is taking help from other countries, possibly Japan, possibly uh, some other countries. These are my two questions. Okay, great. If you understand what I Yeah, mean. yeah, great. Should I take a few questions? I think maybe, uh, yeah, do you know where we're Can you pause on it? Yeah, I'm adding. Hi, uh, I'm Udai. I'm a researcher here at ICS. And uh, you mentioned that the high speed railway got a boost from the 2009 stimulus and that it's the perfect industry you said for stimulus because it requires a large investment. Well, I suspect it's got to be a lot more than that because, you know, if that was the main determinant, then they'd also, China would also have a developed, you know, aircraft industry and, you know, so on. So then uh, I just wanted to probe further into or to ask you to elaborate on why high speed rail was the perfect industry for stimulus. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name is Navdeep Bhatnagar. I'm actually associated with a uh, merchant exporter and we also advise a lot of uh, Indian companies on project financing. So that's why this project, this sub topic is of very great interest to me. See, I have got two specific questions. One is that you have though deliberated upon this on uh, in your uh, presentation uh, about the one about the land acquisition because that is the biggest challenge in India that we face and in fact in almost all of the world over all across. Now is it because of the autocratic system that China has over there that they can overrule everybody and if they want to make a road they can make it. 
because I I have got an experience of a China uh, coal uh, construction company which had taken up a road project in India and they failed miserably just because of this reason. Number one. Number two, about the debt, which my uh, one of my colleagues over here it, he asked <coughs> that how is this uh, debt has been is being sustained? You know, I have travelled a lot in China and I have taken a lot. Uh, bullet trains and normal trains a number of times. Now, I also find the rates are very reasonable. You know, in fact, our Shatabdi or Razani might be much more expensive than this particular train. So, how is it surviving? Because, you know, the kind of uh, return of investment, what is expected, I think it may not be coming in. And last but not least, if I am right, the uh, railway minister about whom you talked about, he was uh, arrested, put on uh, trial, and executed on the 28th day. And as per China's rules, even the bullet is to be paid for by his family, which his family had to do. So that's that's what my uh, observations are. If you could elaborate upon that. Okay. I'm Shishat Khan. Uh, I'm a researcher in Japan, and especially in data translation. So bullet train is one of the areas of my interest. Uh, when you were saying in your presentation, you said that uh, the bullet train was cheaper than the flight. You know? mm -hmm. it, it was cheaper. But in Japan, what I found that uh, almost all the bullet trains, the, uh, the fare of the bullet train is uh, more expensive than the air fare. So, how come Japan, China has been able to uh, do it? There was one exception in Japan, uh, very recently, that uh, the bullet train between Tokyo and Hokkaido uh, has, like, they could minimize the fare by 17 yen. 17 yen, 17 yen. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, so that it became a news that now the bullet train ticket would be a bit cheaper than the flight ticket, and that would be 17 yen. Then the flight, so. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, these are great questions. Um, and. Uh, these are really good questions. I think a number of them kind of are about financing and debt. So I'll try to address that first. Um, yeah, so the fare structure, it really is um, potentially priced at uh, sort of below cost recovery uh, at this point. So there are a number of implications for that. Right? So that's why, and in fact, um, it's not exactly transparent uh, how the pricing is determined, um, but it seems as if um, Pricing is, is is set to sort of be competitive with airfare, and then airfare aviation in China is, is not like India. India's aviation industry is fantastic, and it's very cheap and very it's actually very comfortable. Um, and China is notoriously uh, uh, delayed and full of flight cancellations. So by pricing um, tickets roughly in line with airfare um, for certain distances, say below um, 500 kilometers. It's uh, viewed by many Chinese consumers as a much more economical way to travel uh, than flying. Um, so, uh, what what this means, though, is um, just, just one intervention yeah. here. When you're talking about the pay structure, I mean, please tell us also about the three uh, tiers, three kinds of fares, right? So, I don't know the gentleman there also. When you're comparing with Shatadi or Razan, are you comparing the lowest? <laughs> the lowest one, the same, same. Or the highest? Because the highest, in many cases, is more, much more than mm -hmm. the price. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so actually, I'm, I'm comparing what's called second class, which is actually the, yeah. It's it's just the same as Shatadi. Yeah. The second class in China is almost similar as in uh, ah. Shatadi over here in India. And then, railway stations are lounges, business lounges. If you have a first class ticket, you can even sit there and eat free food. <laughs> so, like the air air model, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, right. So, um, and those, those are the tickets that sell the most, the second class. That's why. So, what does it mean in the long term, though? So, who's going to pay for all this? Where, where's all the money coming from? Because most of the lines, like I mentioned, are loss making, and in fact, if anything, the situation will only get worse in some ways. So, the lines right now that are profit making are the ones that were built the earliest. Those are the ones, again, along the major Tulsa cities. Um, and those ones, yes, you can expand capacity, and yes, some of them are very profitable, but they're nowhere near profitable enough to cover the full operating costs, much less the debt of um, building up the system in the first place. And now, with the expansion into the West, where actually capacity utilization is even lower than in the coast, right? So your, your recovery of costs is going to be even worse 
um, there are real fears, especially by a lot of um, critics within China of this whole program, that this will just lead to further building of debt. So the question um, you guys had asked earlier about whether debt will go down, increase, stay the same, uh, at this rate, if things stay, stay the same, debt is only increasing. In fact, it's increasing at a very rapid pace because you're having compound interest right on top of it. Um, in addition to uh, uh, still a high level of spending. So um, the, yeah, there's a number of ways so far that um, China's trying to deal with some of these issues. So one major one is actually um, sort of a debt equity swap strategy. Um, and this is not just in the uh, railway industry, but also in other industries as well, where essentially you um, corporatize on um, various components of um, train operations. So right now, actually, China's in the process of turning its various regional railway bureaus into corporations. Um, China Railway Corporation was founded on this principle. And then you list this company on the market. Um, that is, you float a certain number of shares um, to the private sector. And actually, then, of course, right, what's the line, what's the boundary between the private sector and the public sector in China? It's, it's not always that clear. But the idea is to try to get uh, outside investment to sort of shore up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the balance sheet for um, for these uh, trains. Another issue also that has been discussed is whether fares will increase, right? So, um, Shinkansen prices are extremely high. I've traveled in Japan on these, uh, on the bullet trains, and I, I was shocked by how much of my budget I spent, you know, not on accommodations, but really just on, on taking these trains. Uh, in Europe, they can be fairly pricey as well. Um, Britain is, is, is kind of a special case because they really um, messed up their privatization um, strategy, and China actually saw that and was very scared of that the same thing would happen, um, that it would sort of ruin their industry. Basically what happened in Britain is um, competition is kind of mixed, but not, not strong enough, and fares have skyrocketed for major uh, train uh, passengers. So one possibility is that fares increase. Um, yeah, there, uh, another possibility too is, um, or sort of the main, the main sort of hope, I think, for this whole system though, is one I think that actually um, reaches back into the broader Chinese sort of political economy, which is that actually a lot of this debt is, in a way, um, a bet on Chinese future growth, right? as, as debt usually is, right? So um, a lot of the financing comes from state banks, and they also make bets on um, land, uh, essentially, through um, loans to local governments, right? So I don't know if you guys have been following, but a lot of local governments are heavily in debt. Um, but the, the model there is that local governments get loans from um, Chinese state banks, and in return, they sort of use either explicitly or implicitly um, their own uh, state on real estate in the urban area as sort of collateral. And the idea is that you should always, you should never be underwater such that the value of your land is lower than the value of the loans, uh, or at least the projected value of the land is never, never lower than the loans. There, there are some people who have calculated and made projections and thought that might, that might uh, not make sense. But essentially, what happens is Right. Whenever a country dissolves very quickly, land prices go up, and in, in the Chinese case, because land is owned essentially by the state, uh, in urban areas it's explicitly owned by the state, in rural areas it is owned in theory by collectives, but it can be um, turned into uh, um, sort of marketable land only by a state um, conversion. So, in other words, state-controlled land. So in China, increasing real estate prices actually um, benefits the um, public finances. In many other countries, that's not the case. So in India, um, a lot of the gains, essentially, from having built out the railway system or having built additional infrastructure doesn't get, doesn't get captured by um, state-owned enterprises. It gets mostly taken by um, uh, private sort of businesses and private users who can... So there's a question about how much you want to balance between sort of private versus public um, share of growth. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so a big question then is how, what will be China's sort of growth going forward? What will be the growth in land prices going forward? And that's just a big question mark that uh, I'm afraid to sort of wade into, but kind of lies at the crux of this issue of China railways and a lot of the local government debt. Um, I just want to mention um, some of these other issues that you guys uh, uh, brought up. So um, uh, you had asked about the stimulus and why uh, the high-speed rail program was chosen. Um, and I mentioned, right, it, it's a very quick way to spend money. But also, you're right, um, that was one component of it. But let's say there was no uh, financial crisis in the first place, right? There was already a Chinese high-speed rail program. And 
I think uh, there are a number of reasons why China decided to pursue this project uh, as opposed to other projects, right? That money could have gone into, say, a massive um, universal basic income, you see, or a, uh, a massive in investment in uh, local education or rural education or many other, um, you know, there's a very high opportunity cost, in other words, of, of having to pursue this program. And I think there's another reason why this was chosen, um, and one is that uh, it's seen as a prestige project for the Chinese state, right? Um, and it's uh, an area where the Chinese government can feel like they can show off to their own people and to the rest of the world um, that China is not just a poor developing country, but in fact now rising and, and, and um, approaching the cutting edge of, of technology. Um, on top of that, I do think that the fact that Japan had a Shinkansen um, kind of feeds into the Chinese-Japanese rivalry, which is always there. And also, perhaps an even greater rivalry today, is I, I do sort of speculate that the fact that the US has failed to um, really develop its own passenger system, railway system um, going into ever since sort of the highways program of the 1960s, and the fact that today um, the US has really failed to build any kind of bullet train system of its own, I think is another reason why um, the Chinese government sees this as a great way to sort of literally leapfrog over the U.S. or do something that the U.S. can't do. Um, so I, you know, some of these things are speculation, but I, I do think that they play some symbolic role. And um, yeah, if you follow the Chinese media, um, the railways are talked about uh, constantly. It's incredible how much they, they feature in the news. And I think that is both a testament to efforts by the state, um, Chinese state, to try to use this as a, uh, as a form of legitimacy. Uh, to say that we built this for the Chinese people, and that's why we should, we deserve to be in power. But also, I think it's a testament to the power, to the political power of the railways itself, and that's the final kind of component of this, which is that um, they they have for a long time been very politically powerful, and so um, right, the tail wags the dog in this case, where they can kind of convince, um, perhaps, or influence um, efforts by the Ministry of Finance or the National Development Reform Commission to um, feature uh, railways more prominently. In, 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 uh, major uh, investment plans. Um, and then on the issue of the uh, of sort of indigenous technology. Um, manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the basic narrative is that um, it started with a, a massive sort of technology acquisition program. And today, from Japan, from Germany, from Canada, and from France in particular, for the trains themselves. And then in terms of the actual civil engineering work, a lot of that came from many different contractors who were brought in. So in the early days, every Chinese uh, high-speed rail project had not just a uh, Chinese accounting team and a Chinese engineering team, but they usually had some kind of um, foreign consultant involved. Um, and today, uh, from the documentation that I've seen and from, from my conversations with people, um, that has really come down a lot um, to the point where, I mean, in interviews at least, people will boast that China, that the average Chinese rail engineer has more experience now and would be the foreign consultant now to, say, uh, the US, the California bullet train. Um, so, uh, but the, the, the story that, uh, for the most part, I, 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 do, I do buy is that in the beginning there's a lot of sort of learning from other countries, especially Japan, um, and now a lot of that has sort of been internalized. Um, and one of the remarkable stories is actually how um, China learned, did, did try to learn from countries that it had very historical uh, problematic relationships with, like Japan, right? So, um, and, and tried to learn not just engineering techniques, but also managerial techniques. Um, so, I, I think that was a big part of the story. Um, and then, um, so the, the, the question about land acquisition is, yeah, it's, it's one of the toughest ones. Um, so, I have to say that in terms of the ability for um, uh, uh, for Chinese local residents to really fight back and push back against the state, whether it's just a story of a very strong authoritarian centralized system that can kind of um, bulldoze literally uh, um, the interests of, of local residents, um, it's very hard to really pin this down because on the one hand, especially in urban areas like I mentioned, um, there are actually quite a number of high profile cases where um, especially urban middle class um, residents have been able to push back and have protested. For example, there was an effort to build a second maglev. Um, there's a maglev train in Shanghai um, to reach the airport, and um, there was a, a, a it was floated. At, the possibility was floated that they would build a second maglev train, and that was highly um, highly opposed by a number of local residents who believe that the magnetic electromagnetic magnetic radiation would affect them. 
Um, there have been efforts also, there's cases in Beijing, the backlash, um, that are also covered by the Chinese media, interestingly. Um, of course, again, from people I've spoken with, um, you'll see much less of that, and you'll see much less coverage of that in the more rural areas and also areas further out west, where people are less educated, they have less access to resources to organize, um, they don't have access to the same um, lawyers and the same sorts of um, political connections that you need to work in order to, to, to push back. Um, at the same time, though, I don't think that's the whole story. I don't think it's as simple as, um, you know, China's just an authoritarian state, so they can just do whatever they want. And, um, you know, India is a massive democracy, so that's why things are, are, are so good. The U.S. is a very strong um, sort of legal system, and that's why a single sort of, um, in China they're called nail, nail houses. Things are um, a single sort of like local resident that opposes can block a whole project. I don't think it's purely a function of the, of the local structures. I do think that other issues come into play. Uh, one is that uh, I do think in the U.S. there's a very litigious culture, right? Um, especially in California where I'm from. Um, and I also think that um, the actual state resources, and by that I mean literally the number of people, for example, who can go out and do sort of land registration. And um, right, so in India most of that is done by um, uh, uh, um, sort of revenue officers. Um, and they're, they're called different things in different parts of the country. But uh, they're actually extremely overburdened, right? Many of them are sort of IS officers who are extremely overburdened with other um, other responsibilities, like, for example, preparing for the elections as they come up, or mm -hmm. um, dealing with other sort of um, tasks that the, uh, like a state chief minister might, might have them uh, work on. And so on that long list of priorities, somewhere in there is dealing, is trying to figure out who owns which land. And that is actually crucial for land acquisition. So beyond um, the issue of whether the land can be turned over in the first place, you have to figure out who owns it and uh, who rightfully deserves compensation. So I think that that is a major limiting factor I've seen in the um, in, in a lot of Indian infrastructure development. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of different issues involved. It's very hard to sort of parse out which matters more, but I don't think it's as simple. And then finally, I do want to just kind of met, re, you know, remind remind everyone that um, yeah, a big part of the Chinese model was to not use as much land or to minimize land use, um, which I think is sort of being tried for the uh, Mumbai Ahmedabad bullet train. Um, and yet somehow, even though actually a lot of it is supposed to be, I think, built in viaducts uh, along the Japanese model, because obviously it's done with Japanese um, support, still somehow um, there is massive uh, opposition to land opposition. So this is still a puzzle I'm trying to figure out. And if you guys have any insights into this, I'd, I'd like to hear more. But somehow there's something else going on that makes it very, very difficult to, uh, to acquire land uh, in India and now also in the US. Um, and then, uh, oh, something about the railway minister. Uh, <laughs> he's always a colorful character. But um, yeah, I, essentially, uh, he is in jail for life now. Uh, no, I heard that he has been executed. And that's that's actually uh, Chinese guys, they quote, you know, when they compare our legal system with their legal system, Maybe they quote. That he has been executed. Yeah, well, we'll see. That. You know, things change fast in China. You don't know. Huh? Um, you never yeah. know. And the political winds can change very quickly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's why, actually, it's funny. There's a joke that everyone always talks about in China, which is um, nobody envies these government officials who, yes, they make a ton of money, and, you know, there's endless corruption, and they have a lot of power, and they and they really sort of abuse in many cases. But nobody really envies them because they're playing a life and death game. <laughs> <laughs> they're almost like, you know, it's like... Um, you really, if you fall out of power, it's not just that you resign and then you go into early retirement. You could be in jail for life or, or possibly more. So I, I think it's sort of interesting to see. No, actually, he is said to be the second most influential person after Xi Jinping at one time. Um, he is also famous that on one particular day in China, 32 bullet trains were launched. And within around three or four weeks, this guy was arrested and put to trial. So, you know, how the fortunes can change yeah. in China. And, actually, and India, they continue. The fortunes, they continue in India. India, they contest elections. Our railway minister, there was a, there is a railway minister who, who is in behind bars and he's enjoying his life in hospital. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I do think there is something interesting here that I, I would like to bring up and just mention because um, I think there's an interesting tension between uh, anti-corruption efforts and sort of this great leap uh, model of, of development. And it's interesting that someone like um, the Chinese Railway Minister really embodies this, which is that 
Um, he kind of broke all these rules. I mean, the stories, you should, you, if you really are curious, you can go look up the stories about you know, his many homes and mistresses and all this stuff. Um, but uh, he, on the one hand, was notorious for being on top of this empire of sort of corruption. Um, at the same time, though, he was really, um, he's still to this day um, praised by, uh, by many Chinese that I, I, I met and talked to and heard from who believe that, you know, well, whatever it takes, today we have this bullet train system. So, uh, you know, what's the, do the ends justify the means, or I don't know how this all works, but, um, but I do see from the Indian Railway side a very interesting dynamic going on, which is that actually um, there is a culture that is very anti-risk-taking because everyone's afraid of a corruption investigation. And uh, maybe you guys are all familiar with this, but um, to me it was just fascinating to hear how scared um, railway officials were uh, in doing their own day-to-day -day work, right? Because um, even if you are actually not um, uh, final, if, even if there's an investigation and you're found to be not guilty, um, and you're not punished at all, and you're completely hungry, actually, it can just completely ruin your career. That's right. You will lose the year or two years or three years of investigation time when your work is put on hold. Your promotion will be completely derailed. Um, and ultimately, right, the, the leaders who are able to rise up um, through the hierarchy are the ones in the integrated ways, are the ones who um, were able to avoid these sorts of um, uh, corruption investigations. So I, I, I don't know. It can, go, it can go both ways, right? On the one hand, who is not against, uh, who, who is not in favor of anti-corruption? Who is really in favor of corruption? But on the other hand, um, you know how you go about it, how you make sure that it doesn't actually stifle um, risk taking and um, uh, uh, and breaking. You know, some rules are important and they're good, but some rules are really just uh, legacies of you know previous administrations or even even in, in this in, in the Indian case, legacies of the British that really you know don't need to be there, but it's very hard to, to, to remove them. So, uh, to me, there's a tension between. Um, trying to balance out between the anti-corruption efforts and, uh, and, and building out the country. Yeah. So. Uh, what is the status of the anti-corruption Yeah, I think the status of, what is the status of uh, the conventional rail system in China? Is it gradually disappearing or, uh, you know? Or it still exists because one doesn't hear of anybody using those trains. Nobody's using them. <coughs> I have two. Uh, India people, I will be most barrier by the system, the ability to use it for free transport. So, how do you see the capacity of high SSR to reshape the logistic network in China, whether it's how, how far it's used to transport the basic commodities? Um, Number two, I you I do recall you know, you even person you mentioned that you interaction with the Indian railway officials to try to recommend uh, promote uh, this in India. So for well, not quite but well, I talk about it. Fine. Yeah. So uh, uh, do you think for a country like India is it worth the for state of model you say to the exact compression experience there was a lot of subsidies? Since you do a research focus on comparative as state capacity to develop in project those countries. So how do you uh, what's your take on what India should do to better improve the state of model in the country? Yeah, so uh, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think that uh, the state of model is very important for India. Uh, you know, the uh, state of model is very important for India. You know, the state of model is very important for India. You know, the state of model is very important for India. Him to promote aviation as a new means of transport. Do you think India should go with aviation or if it should be the way of what you're The question is about the sociology of technological adaptation and how you bring into technology and make it your own and then go beyond it. Which many other countries have done. Okay. India seems to be a singular failure. When we're importing the Russian hardware, military hardware, fifties and you see India's largest importer of military hardware in the world till uh, Our metro system uh, we started in almost 30 years ago, early 90s. And still in many metro sections when the under underground tunnel, the requirement is to have joint venture with some public companies. And in many other areas we'll find that even adaptation technology, they have to get the technology, but then it just remains there. And for the next application, you again go and buy that. This certainly has not been the model of China. From a sociological perspective, why that is since really we have, of course, much more in China and India. So India also has a problem. Okay. 
And my guess is that the empty direction of the thing is the civil war. Because one has to look more deeply, with my understanding, uh, about, you know, deeper cultures about how people take their work, how committed they feel towards quality. And there, I mean, uh, I think there could be deeper differences between India as a working culture versus other countries. So I'd like to put observations on that. Uh, in relation to the, the presentation, you mentioned about the exchange of technology for the market share. Mm -hmm. So as a, from a firm's and a company's perspective, uh, won't it lead to a more competition in the market? So how does the company see then what, what kind of technology uh, exchange are you talking about in this aspect? So like if a firm sees it, uh, that the share of technology will lead to a more companies getting into the same market. So what is the amount of exchange are we talking about? And plus with this, uh, is there any defense uh, like support from the government or the state for the, for the companies that share the technology in the further competition or the further market? Thank you. Thank you for your very exciting presentation. I'm saying exciting because uh, I have uh, Given enough in China bullet trains. Today I felt that you took us on a bullet train ride. <laughs> very, very well presented. But uh, a couple of uh, comments. Uh, uh, and you mentioned about the pricing structure of the funding of the entire system, of the who, who bears the debt, etc. It was a very opaque system, very different from the so, and I would like to draw your attention to a very small aspect of this bullet train, but again part of the opaque system. And that's a tip to anyone who is going next to China to take a bullet train. It's a very peculiar thing that if you take a bullet train which arrives to your destination at 6 o'clock in the evening or before, you get free refreshment for dinner. And if it arrives at 2 minutes past 6, then you don't. <laughs> And you pay the same fare, right? And I asked them, and I got the standard answer, which I've been getting to various other questions ever since. That you should quit That it's a law, right? It's a rule. So I don't know you experienced this. That that one. And the second, uh, you also mentioned in your presentation that almost the speed with which I think every week on average or something, a coal plant. Uh, I mean, is that for supplying electricity to the trains? No, that's just general. That's just general. Yeah. So where does this train get uh, its electricity supply? Because this was uh, a big news last year, uh, early last year, and because of the very bad weather and heavy snowfall in northern China in particular. So the supply was uh, disrupted, and, and hundreds of bullet trains were uh, stuck. So whether they have you know, overcome that system or not, that is one. And um, you mentioned about, I mean, there, we, we spent quite a uh, lot of time about the railway minister. I'm very curious to know from you also that is there any successful minister in China who has either not been removed or jailed? <laughs> because, because one keeps reading about uh, how ministers are being, you know, especially corruption charges. So my question is, is it really corruption charges or is it is something else? It's political witch hunting or something etc. We have more questions. Okay, great. Yeah, so let's take this. So uh, that last question, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't want to actually even try. <laughs> I don't want to be the next person on the list. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, I, I do want to yeah, there are a number of really interesting questions here, and especially the ones about India, because for me, actually, originally when I did this project, I was just going to study China, and actually, it really helps to study the two countries together, because otherwise, everything in China seems so so uniquely Chinese, and what can you say about the rest of the world? And then everything in India feels so uniquely Indian, and what can you say about the rest of the world? And then when you put the two countries together, you see actually there's some common challenges that they share. There's, you know, they're, yes, they're very different in terms of political system, but also there's other sort of when you dig a little bit deeper, there's actually uh, a lot of areas for comparison. At least that's my hope. Um, that's what I'm trying to argue. So um, maybe I'll start actually, your, your question actually about um, technological uh, acquisition and adoption. 
is one that uh, really I find fascinating is actually also part of one of the underlying drivers behind this project because it has been remarkable to me to see the Chinese program where, you know, you know, the words that they use to describe it are so simple, right? We acquire, we re-innovate, and then we indigenize, and then, you know, and they have these, these targets. Um, so, you know, uh, next year, our train should be 50% Chinese. And the year after that, the 6% of the of the value of the train should be Chinese. And actually, many industries in China have the same type of system. Um, at the same time, it's not always successful. So actually, um, people in China who study this, uh, who study sort of uh, industrial policy in China, will often point to the auto industry, which in many ways has been a failure. Because how many Chinese uh, auto companies do you know about today? You know about very few. And um, that was seen as a failure because many of the Chinese auto companies formed JVs, but didn't actually innovate, and didn't actually sort of take on and become you know, a Samsung or Huawei or something of their own. They just uh, remain comfortable with a, a protect, very protected Chinese domestic market. Um, so uh, it doesn't always work. But um, the puzzle is especially key for India because actually, and this is what I always say, um, uh, this is what, always what I think about in the Indian case, India is not a normal developing country, in the way, and China is not a normal developing country. Because of the resources that India has that I think are fairly unique among uh, countries in, in the developing world. And some of those include an extremely good um, higher education system. The IIT, for example, and IIMs are world class. I mean, a lot of the universities um, produce extremely good uh, uh, research output. Um, in China, they also have some good universities, and they're able to join those with industry, uh, as I mentioned in that slide. And it's still puzzled to me why um, a lot of that know how and a lot of this sort of world class um, engineering talent is not being combined with uh, um, uh, things like uh, the railways here. Um, so yeah, one you know I, I did ask some people. So I, I, I talked to some people who worked on the um, on the uh, Mumbai Amdabad project here, and I asked them, you know, what kind of tech acquisition agreements you have with Japan, for example, which is where most of the technology come from. And the response has been um, none. And I'm puzzled again. In China, there would never be a, a wholesale. Okay, we'll just pay pay you. Sort of like a, 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 like a fee for service. Where you just have like a, a, a like a wholesale um, a, a service where you just come in, you just build everything, and then we just pay you with a great amount. And China is always about trying to make it Chinese. At least that's the narrative, right? At least that's that's the goal that they're, they're trying to push for. So I, I was still very puzzled why there wasn't any pushback, even in a case where you have Japan giving soft loans. You know, it's supposed to be a bit more of a, a sort of a cooperation type thing and not just a normal sort of business arrangement. But so you could see that there should be some kind of technology transfer. So um, the response that I've, I've gotten, and so far I guess it's my operating kind of hypothesis, is that there's not enough coordination within um, railways and not enough sort of uh, uh, long-term commitment to something. So in China, right, when the Ministry of Railways announces that they're going to build 12,000 kilometers of high-speed rail in the next 10 years, they really mean it. And uh, Siemens and Alstom, these you know German and French companies, they take it seriously and they uh, at least play serious bids and they are willing to go through this process. But um, here in India, I guess this is I'm I'm not going to kind of repeat what I've heard. Um, if um, Indian Railway says they're going to do the same, there's not the same kind of credibility among um, technology partners uh, that this would this would really uh, play out. Um, whether it's ultimately good for the for for, for India's sort of particular set of uh, 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 India's particular situation is really tough to say because on the one hand, um, you could just go uh, sort of the American model, which is highways and aviation. Um, the plus side of that is that India is already doing that very, very quickly. Aviation is taking off extremely well, and why that's a good thing. Um, the downside is that you have both extremely bad traffic, which you know we experience here in Delhi, but also I grew up in LA, and that was just sort of defined every part of life. And also, it's just very bad for the environment, and it's not that economical um, to some extent, um, especially in a high population density country like India. Um, and so, uh, I'm a bit torn. And ultimately, I guess I have to kind of give a, a, a weak answer to this, which is just I do think it's worth uh, trying to see that it'll 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 work. I think um, the metro system is uh, here in India is a fantastic success case, actually. Where um, I mean, the Delhi metro, for example, is one of the largest now in the world. I was here, you know, when I, when I first came to India uh, nine years ago or something, um, it was just a few lines, and now it's, 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 it's incredible. Uh, it's, it's grown at a pace that if you had told me it was the Chinese who had built it, I would just say, oh, okay, it's a Chinese-type kind of trajectory. 
But um, yeah, it's really remarkable, and now it's bringing in other cities. So, um, but if you had asked me before the Metro had started whether it was possible, I might have been a bit more skeptical and thought, well, it's a very complicated project. There's land issues still, even though a lot of the underground stations are, are above ground. Uh, there's a lot of politics involved, so I don't know if it's possible. So in that case, yeah, I, I really don't know. At the same time, yeah, uh, you know, if it's not working, right, if the high-speed rail in India is too expensive or not if people use it, um, I, I do think there could be demand because there is demand for flights between um, uh, across these distances and at that price point. Um, but it may, the project itself may not uh, um, roll out. I, I don't, or it may take a very long time. And in which case, you have to really think hard about the opportunity cost. Right, that money could have gone into uh, doubling lines in India, which is what the Indian Railway is really trying to focus on, which could add more capacity in a way that's much more economically efficient than building a brand new, you know, sort of luxury, like a bullet train. Um, but it, it's very hard to say. Um, and then, um, yeah, what happened to convention, conventional rail in China? Um, actually, it's still widely used. Um, it's used less than before, but um, many people still take it because it's cheaper. Um, and um, yeah, there is a certain phenomenon that's kind of interesting. Um, it, it's called um, um, big off deal, to be high speed rail in China, which was, it, it kind of flared up in the media earlier. Um, it's not as, uh, as well talked about now, but this idea that actually um, the Chinese government is trying to reduce conventional rail uh, trains to kind of push people, to force them to take high speed rail. So, yeah, I can see this maybe in certain areas. In certain areas, I don't see this. It's very hard to really tease this out. Maybe it is partly a somewhat intentional strategy. Other people argue that the aviation industry is purposely bad in China because they want people to take the trains instead. Again, I don't, I don't know if that's really the case. Um, but it is interesting that um, that there there is a shift, right? Uh, but people are still using um, conventional rail to a large extent. Yeah, it is so much much cheaper, and yeah, there are so many people who at that price point are willing to spend uh, a day or two on um, taking the trains in three or four hours. Um, yeah, um, maybe freight. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So uh, if I understood your question correctly. Um, it's sort of how the bullet trains might affect freight capacity. It could have been in the area of the enhanced logistic network for business enterprises in China. Yeah, so for the most part, bullet trains don't affect freight directly. Right. The idea was that uh, freight capacity is freed up by transferring passengers away from conventional rail to the bullet trains, and then the freight can then run along those share tracks. Um, which actually is the interesting thing is Indian trains can run much faster. Um, it's not a technological issue, it's just that a lot of tracks are shared with freight trains, which are very slow. It's actually, the same problem occurs in the US, uh, and even Germany to a certain extent, where um, you know, if you have a freight, a freight that has right away and that passenger train is behind it, you're kind of stuck. Except in cases like Shatabi's. The whole idea with Shatabi, for example, is to um, be able to have priority in, uh, in track usage. So uh, it's actually not that the Shatabi's, the engines are really that much more uh, sophisticated, um, which uh, so it's, it's sort of interesting that um, it does have an indirect impact, this sort of building out of the passenger dedicated high speed rail lines. And there are efforts to try to like ship some goods on them. And yeah, China's logistics uh, industry is actually strangely um, underdeveloped. Uh, a lot of the trucking is really just sort of one man, uh, you know, it's where a, a family owns a truck and they literally just drive it. So that's quite under, underdeveloped and um, the integration of of freight trains into the whole logistics industry is actually actually has a long way a, a long way to go. So it's actually sort of interesting to see uh, efforts to try to think creatively about how to use, especially this very expensive uh, infrastructure that they just spent so much money um, developing to try to solve some of those issues. So yeah, it, it, it's it's sort of unclear. Yeah, um, yeah, um, maybe yeah. Yeah, I, I know I didn't touch on all the questions, but maybe maybe we should do yeah, one more quick, quick round. Of, um, then yeah, then can, and then yeah, just be like another two minutes. Yeah, I am Nizar Khan. Uh, my questions are basically in three questions. Number one, what is the competitive advantage internationally China has in manufacturing bullet train? Number two, what is the benchmark? cost in construction and number three <coughs> see uh, 
basically uh, one more addendum to the similar question is see, during my interaction with some of these Chinese contractors, construction firms, I found that their quote, what they quote is generally very competitive. In fact, very very lower, much lower than what somebody else might be quoting. Now, possibly that is the reason why they are able to get you know the good projects almost all across the world. Now, my question is that even in the construction uh, tenders, is there any support or explicit or implicit by the Chinese government to these construction companies? Because most of them, they are state-owned enterprises. So, does the government of China also subsidize or give a push, you know, uh, some kind of incentive to these SOEs so that they become successful all across the world? So, maybe you could... Uh, number three, uh, number three, I just recollected uh, what is the threshold of high speed? So it depends on, there's different definitions, but it could be over 200 kilometers per hour. Um, some people say a more strict definition is over 250. But I think usually it's 200. Yeah, in Europe, for example. Um, yeah. is there, oh yeah. um, my name is Lushi. So I had questions more about the, the financing part of it. So you said initially that it was initially it was state financed, then it sort of became a public private partnership as of right now. However, both of those models have failed in terms of infrastructure financing in India. So my question is more about how and why I guess China is able to carry out a plan which has failed on a much larger scale in India. And another question was about the scalability of it. So the Belt and Road Initiative actually talks about scaling the bullet trains to other nations by land or water. But as you pointed out that beyond say 500 kilometers, it's actually much easier and much cheaper to go by a flight. Then why would the bullet, the Belt and Road Initiative even succeed? Okay, great. Um, yeah. My question is, at the national level, between road transport, air transport, and rail transport, how they figure? Like in India, the rail transport is uh, maximum. In fact, there is a saying that India moves by rail. Most of the passengers and most traffic especially moves by, by, by rail. And the British established this system for the first years and it's an extensive throughout the country. Throughout the country, it's a very extensive network of railways. So what is the condition in China if you come here with India? Do we have any take this from? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll start actually with yours um, because um, uh, actually the two countries are facing some more challenges. Um, in both countries, uh, rail is extremely important, especially as a, especially for passenger transport. And uh, in both countries today, um, I, I think I mentioned highways are really taking off. I mean, actually, the amount of investment that I mentioned in the Chinese railways is actually dwarfed by the amount of investment in Chinese highways, which is actually mostly run at the provincial level. It's not a central government issue. Um, so, uh, and in India, a similar situation is happening as well with highways and aviation overtaking. Um, uh, another thing is also Chinese ports, Chinese shipping was really taken off. Uh, I think that is less true here, but again, basically these other sort of competitive modes of transport have really uh, eaten away at that. Um, yeah, India does have a very different historical position in these railways because of the extensive network that was uh, uh, that existed from the British, you know, on the eve of independence here. Um, but also, it's a bit of a mixed legacy because a lot of that. Uh, that a lot of the network is designed not for the efficient transportation of passengers um, per se, but really more for military control over over India and for um, moving commodities cheaply, uh, especially for export out of the country. So, um, yeah, it's a bit, bit of a mixed legacy. Some people argue that actually uh, uh, the sort of sunk costs in India hurt um, future the country's future chances of really, you know, China sort of sort of started fresh or fresher than India did. Um, this is not entirely true. And yet, yeah, China did have a, 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 some kind of railway network before as well. Uh, ironically, the first Chinese uh, railway was also built by the British. Uh, it was a joint venture, uh, British and I think Germany. 
Um, and I think it may even have been um, British engineers who worked on the Indian Railways. Um, yeah, there's a great there's a great history of the Chinese Railways. If, if anyone's interested, but um, yeah, actually, uh, to come back to uh, financing and subsidies, which I think uh, go together, and also, um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, the the short answer is that yes, for a lot of these SOEs, for these key industries, um, I think um, the subsidies can be much less explicit, but very very powerful, which is um, especially very cheap loans from uh, state banks, who um, in turn uh, are able to offer these cheap loans because it's sort of within the family, right? It's within the government system. So they don't mind offering these cheap loans because they'll know they'll get, they'll get paid back because if there's any issue, they can always go back to um, the rely on the People's Bank of China or some other or the Ministry of Finance to, to make them whole. So, um, and ultimately, the state banks themselves, even though today they talk about increasingly being uh, market-oriented and um, really uh, uh, making decisions based on uh, market considerations. Still, obviously, they are uh, ultimately um, their ability to to choose where to allocate loans is ultimately sort of under the, the supervision of the party and the, the central government in general. So, when you have a stimulus that needs to take place uh, immediately uh, and on a large scale, the banks play a major role in making sure these funds get ch get channeled at a very low uh, rate to. I mean, not a, not a very low rate, but a, a low enough rate to uh, various state of enterprises. So I think that's a very key part of that, and that's also, I think, um, the SOEs that lie sort of at the, the input industries, so the very basic industries, coal and um, steel production, things like that. If those are subsidized, um, and actually this is a project that I sort of want to work on uh, at some later point. My understanding is if those are subsidized, they in turn implicitly subsidize the entire rest of the economy right from the ground up because then you have cheaper steel than you normally have in the rest of the world. Um, but I need to actually look into this because I think actually uh, Chinese <coughs> overproduction of steel results in cheap steel everywhere in the world. So how can the rest of the world not benefit from those, those subsidies? Um, and then, um, yes, I think your point about, um, I, I think you had asked a question about uh, state financing, right, and how Originally, it seemed to be a, a public financing model and then shifted to public-private. Um, in reality, though, it didn't shift. Um, and actually, um, China um, had recently kind of toyed with PVPs, public-private partnerships. Um, but those have kind of gone away, or I don't, I don't hear about them as much anymore. Um, and I think, ultimately, the model has, remained, has actually remained the same, despite um, certain kinds of uh, surface-level changes. So even though some of these um, Chinese state-owned enterprises have now um, gone uh, listed on uh, public markets. Um, in reality, the shareholders don't seem to influence the companies that much, right? So normally, in a normal private company, your shareholders should be involved in major strategic decisions uh, in the, the future of the company. But in many cases, in the Chinese state-owned enterprises, um, their shareholders are more like passive, uh, passive investors who essentially defer to um, the managers who are ultimately appointed, you know, through various means, but ultimately appointed <coughs> through um, the central government. So, um, yeah, so even though it may seem like there's a shift to greater market uh, involvement, in reality, it was more sort of, and this is a very Chinese thing, and I think this is a lot about the Chinese sort of new market system, which is it's using components of the market system, for example, leveraging private sector investment, but um, still keeping it under the auspices of the of the central government overall. So, um, right. So control still remains with uh, with the central government. Um, yeah. And then whether this can be uh, scaled abroad. Yeah. I think it's a really big question. And um, yeah, it's interesting to see there's been um, issues. Uh, yeah, in, in a number of different countries in terms of political um, tides changing, political conditions changing, um, but also. Yeah, there's there's a big question about um, about whether the speed at which China can build uh, within its own institutional context can be replicated in other contexts where you do have, say, a more vocal or independent judicial system or uh, opposition parties or um, you know the electoral electoral dynamics of democracy. Um, so yeah, at, at this point, uh, I do think that some of this is quite unique to the Chinese institutional model. Although there are some things that I think can be. Uh, can be carried over. You know, it's not just a simple matter of um, you take the same Chinese companies, which do go into Africa, they do go into Pakistan, they do go into other parts of the world, 
and yet they don't produce the same kinds of outcomes that you see within China. So I think it's a it's it's a mix of all these things. Um, and then um, yeah, I think maybe I'll just mention something about uh, let's see. I think I, I think I got most of it. Uh, oh, a question about power supply or something like that. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, whether, right, so I, I mentioned that it's not dedicated for, oh yeah, but what happens when you do have these sort of blizzards and shutdowns? Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's also a problem in Japan too. Um, it's sort of interesting. Um, the Japanese Shinkansen system, they have a really, uh, a poor state of the art earthquake uh, emergency system that shuts, it's, it's really amazing how it works. It shuts down all the trains when there's an earthquake of over a certain magnitude. Um, and it, it has been used over and over again. And in a way, that's a good feature. Um, and I don't know. To, yeah, you can you can say that whether the Chinese trains get shut down in the blizzard might be because the power is going to But also, in some cases, there have been a number of cases where it's because of safety reasons, and then they're they're taken offline. Um, yeah, I have to look back at that that uh, that incident really quick because um, yeah, there there was a I think I don't know if it was that, but a couple of years ago there was there was a really massive sort of backup, especially during uh, Chinese New Year. Um, that caused a lot of problems. And actually, that made, um, according to some people, some people believe that that made the government more nervous because actually it's a political issue. When Chinese uh, passengers are upset, um, they blame the government. That's, that's sort of logic. So you better make sure that uh, they can get you know back home in time for Chinese New Year. So, but then again, everything in China is very political. So everything has political implications. Everything has implications for the legitimacy of the, of the government, of the party. Um, so anyways, uh, maybe I'll wrap up there and just Thank you all for coming to this talk. And um, I'm happy to, to chat more later. And I'm happy again to share my presentation. And I hope that we can um, uh, keep in touch and um, you know, maybe work together on something in the future. So I think I summed up in a way. I will just take uh, two minutes. But I think a few issues, the one you pointed out. I your think your question is not answered. No, I think that. Uh, <laughs> labor, labor. No, the the more labor. interestingly, he raised the issue. Because I am looking at the different acquisitions. In the initial stage, we also had that, uh, you know, indigenization as a priority. I don't know where it dropped at that. The social aspects to be needed more to study all this. And Princeton, with its huge sociology basis, may be able to lead us to somewhere. And hope one day Kai will come back and talk more about the social aspects of this. Technology, procurement of the center. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.